We're going to talk about bioculture. I don't mean cultures of cells. I mean culture, society, how people think and relate. Let's get right into it. Here, for example, in the 1970s, as electronics is really kicking up, an incredible experience and pioneering work happens in the Bronx. The invention of hip hop and the turntable and innovators like DJ Grandmaster Flash are figuring out new ways of relating to electronics. And his DJ was fascinating. D DJ Flash was incredible. Uh, I had come up with a mixing technique, which I called the quick mix theory, where I was able to take two copies of the same record on two, on, you know, on two different turntables and repeat the climatic part of the record over and over and over and over and over again. And this was around 1979, where I kind of like saw this, this guy do, I said, this guy, Crossfader switch, breakdance, hip hop. It's a different way of relating to a technology. Right? Let's look a little bit more into electronics. The same time. A um, German music group, Kraftwerk, gets going with computer music, computer world. This is roughly the exact same time the personal computer shows up in Menlo Park, California, on the top left. And so you can see this album they're putting out just a few years later, 1981, deals with the rise of computers in society. Computer love, computer world. What's this all about? If you fast forward, fast forward to today, we have a culture that you could describe as an electronic culture. This is a Kraftwerk concert. I find the scene incredible. You see the audience there, homo sapiens, and what's represented on stage are not homo sapiens. So the fact that we've got electronics all around us, they become part of our lives, maybe overtaken parts of our lives. A lot of this, I think, is traced back to the experiences um, around turntables and switches and computers and, and then playing with those things to build an electronic culture that undergirds everything we experience. Well, this is introduction to bioengineering, not introduction to electronics. Thus, the question becomes, do we have a bioengineering culture or a biotic culture, a biologic culture yet? We kind of do in a historical sense, um, but not in a 21st century sense, I would say. Like, have we learned to sing and dance with bioengineering? And it's not obvious that, that no, right, basically. Um, let me give you some examples. And so what's gonna happen for the rest of the lecture is I'm gonna give you some examples of where we are and how to think about it more formally, and then give you some more examples of people who are pioneering getting to a biotic culture, which will be super exciting. So the juice will be worth the squeeze when we get to the back end of today. So I was out um, picking up a smoothie and it's overpriced, but it's tasty. And I'm looking at the label tells me what's inside. That's pretty cool. Tells me what's inside with an official government approved label. That's pretty cool. But the last side is pretty interesting. It says no GMO. Um, I'll just ignore that because it's really tasty. I don't mind. Who wants to eat something that's modified? That sounds dangerous. I'd like to eat something engineered. So I'll just ignore no GMO. But then this next text right below it, if a bioengineered version of an ingredient exists, we don't use it. Oh, snap. Like, I can't ignore that because I'm a bioengineer. We're teaching introduction to bioengineering. So it's like, no, we don't want you, right? Is what this label is telling me. They're like, I'm buying and drinking this stuff. Doesn't make any sense. So there's something missing or broken in our bioculture. So let's start with the obvious question. How do you feel about GMO foods? You like them, you don't care, you don't know about them, you don't want them. And when you think about the first question, 
what are the underlying questions or topics that emerge? You know, for me and a lot of people, it's like, well, who owns the GMO food or who's profiting or, or is it safe or what's going on? So it's a good spot here to take a little time and discuss and explore how you feel and what the underlying questions are related to this topic. One of the things about GMO foods that turns out to be the case is, you know, they're scary. For some people, they're really scary. But the good news is they don't exist anymore. As of last year, the United States government got rid of GMO labeling on food and replaced it with these fancy new labels derived from bioengineering or bioengineered. The next question is obvious. Does replacing GMO with bioengineering on food labels change your answers to the earlier questions about how you feel about GMOs? Well, if before I might've thought GMOs were scary and now I just replaced the label, now I think bioengineering is scary. Hmm. I mean, it's a clever trick to try and change the labels. And I don't think they talked to any bioengineers about doing this. But now that they're here, it's like it's going to actually change the culture. Maybe, maybe not. But like mostly it's going to mean that how people felt before about GMOs is now how they're going to feel about bioengineering. And see if you can find a bioengineering label on the food at your supermarket, right? On the wrappers or something like that. Are we all good now? I don't think we are. So when I say, you know, I might be afraid of GMOs, they might be scary or bioengineering now is scary. I'm not talking about safety, you know, which is a valid concern. Like, is it safe to eat this? I'm talking about fear. I'm talking about primal instinctive fear. Like some people are afraid of spiders, arachnophobia. And who wouldn't be? Look at this. This is crazy. What if this was under your house? Um, hmm. I'm afraid of falling from great heights. I really am. Um, you know, I couldn't tell you exactly why I am. I could make up the story. It's like, no, 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 no. But like instinctively, I'm afraid of falling from heights. Um what if some people are afraid instinctively of bioengineering in the same way that I'm afraid of heights or somebody you know might be afraid of spiders? That's called bioscarer, by the way, right? Like fear of biotechnology, fear of bioengineering. If I went on Twitter or whatever and said that I was afraid of bioengineering, that I was afraid of GMOs, what would happen to me is 159 Nobel laureates who wrote this letter would accuse me of committing a crime against humanity. They're making the argument, they're not wrong, that people are suffering and dying because they don't have access to good foods with sufficient nutrition and calories, and, and GMOs could help with that. And so anybody who opposes GMOs is literally, they're writing at the bottom, like how many poor in the world must die before we consider opposition against GMOs to be a crime against humanity? So if I go on Twitter and say, you know, I'm scared, of bioengineering, I'm scared of GMOs. What I'm gonna, what I'm, what's gonna happen? Is I'm gonna get yelled at by 159 Nobel laureates. Well, that's not constructive. That's that's not helping anybody. Um, so now it sets up this more interesting question: like, what's gonna win in this this functional debate? Um, the value of a bioengineered product, aka utility, or fear? Shown on the left is Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein. Um, this story is relating a profound fear that many have, which is the fear of being a bad parent. Um, the monster in Frankenstein is the doctor who creates the creature, Dr. Frankenstein, not the monster, um, not the creature. But so like, what's going to win in this societal debate, in this cultural clash? Is it the value of GMOs and they're helping people? Or is it this cultural instinctive fear of bioengineering? This has not been resolved by the first genetic gen engineering generation. Like the folks from 1975 to 2023 have not gotten this right. And we've got to clean up the mess, right? Now, let's start right away. Fear's gift is the opportunity to become courageous. So I'm afraid of heights. When I drive across the Golden Gate Bridge, I can calculate the likelihood it's going to fall. I know someday it's going to fall. If we fall into the ocean, we're all dead, right? Like it's scary. But, you know, I also have a degree in structural engineering and civil engineering, and I can think about the likelihood of it falling and, and 
because we've created a profession of civil engineering um, around all this knowledge and practice, you know, like I can operationalize my fear and I'm going to drive across the Golden Gate Bridge. I'm going to be courageous in the context of a fear of falling from great heights. So fear gives us a gift. And so if we acknowledge that there's bioscare at the low level, how can we turn that into a gift and enable all of society to become collectively courageous with bioengineering? Don't ignore the fear, in other words. Don't shout over the fear and say, but it's useful. You know, like, yes, it's got to be useful, but you can't only shout with that. You've got to acknowledge the fact that there's an underlying bioscare. And could we go from bioscare to biocourage? A tool we're going to use, and this is a profoundly powerful tool, comes from Stuart Brand, graduate of Stanford, class of 1960, and it's called Pace Layering. And this is a tool you can use for so many things in life. We'll give you a quick intro, and you can learn more about it as you like. Um, and we'll try and apply it to bioculture and make sense of things. So Stewart argues that a civilization operates on six characteristic layers. At the bottom is nature, and then culture is built right on top of nature. And then a system of governance derives and sits on top of culture, which then allows for infrastructure to be developed, which then allows for commerce, and then fashion. And so think of these like wooden blocks, a kid building a wooden tower with six blocks. And if the blocks are stacked upright, you got a good civilization. Um, it's called pace layers because the pace of change quickens or accelerates as you go up. Like fashion is fleeting, right? If you wanted to change uh, the uniforms in the army, you know, you just like order a change in the uniforms, you're done. But if you wanted to change the culture in the army, how soldiers behave, whoa, that'd be a lot harder, right? So it'd be just slower to change. And when everything's working, the blocks are stacked and, and you've got a functioning civilization. Um, but, if, but if the blocks are moving um, in ways that don't maintain you know, a good stable tower, things go a little bit haywire. Um, and we're gonna use this tool to uh, help us take complicated topics like bioculture and bioengineering and figure out well, what's really going on across all the layers. Let me give you an example because this is way too abstract, I'm sure. Like, where is the uh, SARS CoV 2, COVID 19, COVID 19 pandemic in the pace layers? And it's interesting, it's like across all the layers. You know, like maybe it emerges from nature. Um, you know, we have an a imperfect public health infrastructure. Um, the commercial supply chains aren't capable of making enough vaccines. Um, our culture in the United States is one of, liberty and independence. And it's like, me, 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 me. Not gonna worry about you too much. Um, you know, so it's hard to do a lockdown without people complaining. Um, you know, what, what, what was on the mask you were wearing? If you were wearing a mask, you know, fashionable. Um, so you can take a complicated topic and, and, and just like separate it across the six layers to try and understand it better. And when you play with the pandemic a little bit more, you can see how when we encountered the pandemic, the blocks didn't align, and so things really toppled over into not a great situation. Um, we're going to take bioengineering and, and bioeconomy, which we just talked about in the previous class, and deploy it across these layers to better understand it. So, for example, um, gosh, we just spent over half an hour talking about the bioeconomy, right? And and that's up in the commerce layer, in the pace layers, and, it, and it's got a little bit of infrastructure. And it certainly got a lot of goods and services and you know, like those fashionable mycological leathers that Michael Works is making for you know, luxury handbags. Um, but I love asking this question. It, you know, like, what would make a bioeconomy American or French or Chinese or Japanese? Is it that the jobs and money are in the 50 states? Like that would make it American? It's in our zip codes? Or is it more to do with things down below, below the commerce layer, like down in the culture layer, what we're talking about today. Um, so we know that bioengineering impacts manufacturing of medicines and food and materials. You know, it's about life, but an American bioeconomy, or we could say an American bioeconomy would not only be about life, but maybe we'd go to the Declaration of Independence and we'd say it's about liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And when we do that, we're invoking the cultural layer, which is lurking down low, and it, it's invisible unless you drill down to it. It's like, well, what, what does that mean? 
Like what, is, what does it mean to implement a, a bioeconomy that advances liberty and the pursuit of happiness? And to figure that out, we'd have to fill in what bioengineering is touching or might do across all the layers in the pace layer framework. And this is a lot to encounter for the first time. And, and so I don't expect you to like parse it all perfectly, but it's like, you know, like what are the movies we're enjoying about bioengineering? Did you see the latest Jurassic World? Actually, there's an evil corporation in it. It's called Biosyn Corporation. And gosh, that's just a transposition of SynBio. Um, you know, it's like, is that the story we're telling? Um, you know, are, are we um, creating a society of bioconsumers or biocitizens? What's our bio strategy? You know, we're seeing in the executive orders and things like that, some thinking around that. We were just talking about how bioengineering might be instinctively scary, just like fear of spiders and heights, bio scare. Um, you know, we're going to have to figure this out. Um, okay, so let me let me just move on and give you some examples of this. I love this movie. Check out those rabbits. What are they doing? Hmm. Looks like they're having fun. Looks like they're playing. You know, like we saw with electronics in the 1970s, people started playing with electronics. There's a very interesting book called Homo Ludens, written by Johann Huizinga in the 1930s. And this is about the idea that play underlies the emergence of culture. He writes, play is older than culture, for culture, however defined, always presupposes society. Animals have not waited for us, humans, to teach them how to play. This is very esoteric. Let me give you a more accessible explanation. Puppies. Mm. Ever see a puppy? Ever see a dog uh, play with another puppy and learn how to play with another puppy? Why are they always like nipping and biting each other? What's going on there? This form of play. This is normal and it teaches not doing more serious biting and also strong social skills. Too abstract. Let's explain it better. When one puppy is play biting another puppy, they're communicating something. I'm going to bite you, but it's not a real bite. It's not gonna cause you to get hurt and bleed. I'm gonna bite you, but it's not a real bite. Trust me. And then the other puppy is like, okay, I trust you, right? I hope I, hope I can trust you, right? And then, you know, the first puppy does the nip, right? And, and like, oh, it worked, you know, like I didn't hurt the other puppy and the other puppy is like, ooh, that was fun, right? And so this, Example of play is revealing that by playing, we're learning how to communicate, how to be honest, how to be trustworthy, how to listen, how to relate to one another. Puppies are just playing with their mouths, um, you know, but we could be playing with electronic music or we could be playing with bioengineering. And if we enable play through bioengineering, that's how people might understand what's reasonable, what's too much, what's harmful, what the limits are. Maybe we just skipped over play in the 1970s when genetic engineering got invented. Maybe we just went right to utility. We're going to cure disease. And even though many people were afraid, we say, don't be afraid. We're going to lock it up in the labs and we're going to do useful things. Right? Oh, well, because that's what happened, like mostly. And so we don't have a biotic society yet. We don't have a bioculture deep underneath the bioeconomy. If we want the bioeconomy to be amazing, we're actually going to have to have an amazing bioculture. We're going to have to have a society that falls in love with bioengineering. Nobody's really done this yet. This is definitely a frontier of bioengineering, and we've been exploring it. So I'm going to close out with three or four examples of play that might inform and inspire your own thinking as it relates to bioculture. The first example comes from a project called Synthetic Aesthetics, which we named the project that, because the words rhyme, like who doesn't like worms, word, words that rhyme? And the one project I wanna highlight was done by Cecil Talas, a perfumer from Berlin 
and Christina Agapakis, a microbiologist at Harvard. And you know, they started by thinking about stinky, stinky cheese and all the microbes that make cheese. So they went to the cheese shop and they got samples of really stinky cheese and they brought that back to the laboratory and spread out the samples on Petri dishes to grow the microbes out to see what the microbes are that make the cheeses in the cheese shop. They learned as they thought about it that some of these cheeses are made in very small volumes by people who work with the material manually with their hands. And so they started asking questions like, well, what's the relationship between the microbes that live on the human skin and the microbes that make the cheese? There's microbes all over the surface of our body in different locations and so on. The next thing they did was they went around the Harvard campus and they asked for volunteers to donate samples of microbes that live on their skin. So they collected a whole bunch of human skin microbes um, using sterile Q-tips and so on. And then they went and got um, raw goat milk and inoculated the milk with these human skin collected microbes and made cheese. So here we see they're making uh, a cheese from goat milk using the microbe found on the toe of a Harvard philosopher or Christina's foot or Christina's hand and so on. And you wait a little bit and sure enough, you can make cheese. So here's cheese made from microbes found in Daisy's armpit and on the philosopher toe, Christina's hand, Cecil's nose. I was in Boston when they had done this and we hadn't thought about biosafety. So nobody was really comfortable eating these cheeses, but we were comfortable sniffing them. And so I still remember Daisy's armpit microbes made a cheese that was very uh, citrus and floral, very nice bouquet. The philosopher toe microbes made a cheese where you really have to invent a new adjective to describe how wrong or foul that cheese smelled and so on. When I had grown up, my mom always said, you know, like eat your vegetables, you, you are what you eat. But what was interesting about this project was it reversed that for me. It said, no, no, we eat what we are. You know, that, that, that the microbes on us can make our foods and somehow we are related to what we're eating. And I didn't know how to think about that. Um, I was having dinner that night with a banker and I, I thought I could ruin his appetite by explaining this project to him. And, and instead he reflected it right back. He's like, oh, billion dollar market, celebrity cheese. Right? And then we started talking about like maybe the Democrats and Republicans could have political fundraising cheeses. Democrats could have a blue cheese or the Republicans could have a washed rind red cheese, you know, uh, depending on who was running and their skin microbes. Is, does this make any sense? I'm not sure, but is it an example of play and like trying to ask new questions and learn what the boundaries are and relate and explore what bioengineering and biotech? Yes. You could take a project like this and say, you know, hey, what if we could change how microbes smell in the first place? These students at MIT back in 2006 said, instead of E. coli having a fecal odor, let's make them smell like wintergreen or bananas by changing the molecules they make. And sure enough, they did that. Well, that's playful. Um, another example would be if we start re-engineering microbes to make flavors, is that going to be good or bad? And and maybe maybe it's not even the right way to think about it. So um, you know, people had reprogrammed the metabolism of yeast to make the molecule that produces the vanilla flavor. And then interestingly enough, civil society organizations that hate GMOs or are concerned about their impacts, like the ETC group, said like no. This is not the right thing to be doing. And, and so it was very interesting to see like, why would somebody oppose somebody else trying to make a vanilla flavor in a fermenter in Italy, right? And, and it turns out when you lift the lid on the right side of the slide, the concern is about the impact on the land and the people involved in the farming of vanilla. And I learned more about this when I was invited to a meeting up in Canada where the World Council of Churches assembled religious leaders from 30 different religions and leaders from First Nations to talk about synthetic biology and the future of food. And I went there as a student to listen, mostly, and the first speaker was Alejandrino Garcia Castano, a vanilla farmer from Mexico. And it turns out that Mexico is, and some places nearby, is, is where vanilla arises naturally. The vanilla from Madagascar and, and other places is you call it colonial vanilla that promulgates and is, is farmed later. And so Alejandrino's talk, as I heard it, 
was a story about how they grow vanilla in the forest. It takes a while uh, after they manually pollinate the flower for the bean to form, about nine months. And they have a set of stories they tell about man and woman and fertilization and gestation and characters in these stories about what's going on. They collectively harvest the beans and dry them in the town square and then bring them to market. When synthetic chemistry, not bioengineering, but synthetic chemistry made artificial vanilla, it dropped the value of vanilla, natural vanilla on the market. And so they struggled to figure out how to compete. Um, they tried to do other things like clearing the forest, planting a different crop, doing intensive trellising. None of that worked very well, changed their relationship with the land, their stories and each other. And so some of them have been going back and re-implementing their traditional practices, but now telling a story about the importance of vanilla such that maybe when I go to buy vanilla in the supermarket, if I can afford it, I'll be more likely to get vanilla from Mexico because I understand that there's a cultural story associated with the practice. Um, so I was talking about this with Donna Haraway, just trying to make sense of it. And you can read the whole discussion we had at the link below. But the takeaway for me was, wow, as a bioengineer, maybe my cultural opportunity here isn't to replace what somebody is doing elsewhere, but to improve and increase the value of the story they're telling such that what they're already doing becomes more valuable. Like maybe I could change the morphogenesis of the vanilla flower to allow for a new character to come up in their cultural story. Or maybe I could add a marker such that when the beans are drying in the town square and they get the right level of water content, there's a signal that triggers a party, right? So that what they're already doing it becomes more awesome in ways that matter to them. And obviously the most important say, thing to say is like, not for me to decide what would be more awesome for them, but to engage in Alejandrino and his colleagues in a conversation about what, if anything, might be interesting. This is what bioculture play looks like. It's like totally different than bioeconomy, like way up top. But if you make any advances in the bioculture level, it'll have massive ramifications and opportunities percolating up. Let me give you another example. Remember, we were talking about DJ Grandmaster Flash. Did you know? that there's a website called Biota Beats. How can you turn your bacteria into sound, right? It's like, we've got a vinyl record and scratching. Maybe I could get a giant Petri dish and put it on a turntable. Does that make any sense, right? Could hip hop save biotechnology as this website represents, right? And sure enough, they're trying. And so you could take a giant Petri dish, not 10 centimeters in diameter, but 12 inches in diameter, and then uh, sample your skin microbes. You're not gonna make cheese in this type of project. Uh, you know, you're gonna make a, a, a record and you're gonna grow microbes from different parts of your body on this giant Petri dish and then use computer image processing to interpret what's going on and turn that into music, right? And guess what? Anybody could do this. These students in Massachusetts are making their Biotic records, right? Oh, look, it's DJ Jazzy Jeff. He's making his giant Petri dish biota record. I wonder what that sounds like. Maybe you should go to the website and check it out. One more example. These are students in India. They're art design students, and they're trying to imagine what their bioengineering project could be. The community they're part of mostly doesn't know anything about genetic engineering, let alone how to play with it or to imagine what it could impact. And so what they ended up doing was a project to help everybody understand what genetic engineering could be. And their idea was to reprogram bacteria to make the smell of the passing of the monsoon. After the rains clear and the soil is drying out, the microbes in the soil that are degrading wood result in a release of a compound called geosmin or geosmin, earth smell. And, and it's like very meaningful if you're in this region of the world when the monsoons are clearing and the soil's drying. So what if you could use bioengineering to bring that odor into a culture of microbes and then share that with people? Like such an interesting insight in terms of how to 
explore and experience play in bioengineering to help others relate to what bioengineering could be such that when they're confronted later with GMO rice, it's like, oh, you know, like I already have a, a feeling for what I've already done that nipping and understand, you know, and I, I have a sense of place. So I have a sense of culture. This becomes so interesting the deeper you go down this rabbit hole. So here, for example, and this will be the last thing I have to offer, is um, what happens when technology changes who can do what? Did you know that 200 years ago, it was very hard to get paint at the store? If you wanted to be a painter, you had to mix up your own paints. But about 100 years ago, a little bit longer than that, it became possible to reliably source paints in foil tubes, so-called ready-made paints. I learned about this from the late Paul Rabinow. And what this reveals is technology is not technology. It depends on the form of the technology and, and how people can interact with and practice the technology. Um, so as we're developing bioengineering tools, in other words, we're gonna change the form of bioengineering and because of that, as you'll see with the example of painting, other things are likely to become possible. Just like the personal computer, the revolution in the personal computer is not in the word computer. It's not a revolution in transistor physics. It's a revolution in who could compute where for what purpose, you know, hence craft work. Or the fact that electronics got good enough that you could take a dimmer switch and crossfade the audio output of turntables and you get hip hop, you know, like, hmm, right? Like technology is not technology. It really depends on the form that the technology takes. So let's explore ready-made paints. Again, the theme is who can use a tool where is more often than not the most important aspect of a tool. So it used to be that if you wanted to get painted, you have to be rich and you have to go to the studio as a patron and get your portrait painted, like all those old paintings of like wealthy Europeans. But if I can like go to the store and just buy paint, then almost anybody could paint, or at least a lot more people could paint. They could paint wherever they want, like paint on the beach. Right, and, and so access to the tool shapes the practice. And if you go look at these paints, paintings around the time that ready-made paints show up, you can actually see like evidence of this. There's grains of sand in the painting. And then if you can change where you can paint and, and so on, you can change who's being painted, right? You're not just painting the rich, you could paint laborers in a field. And, and if you're changing who is being painted, then you're changing historically who's being represented in the paintings. Right. And who has standing and who was a member of society. Right. It's like, isn't that interesting? Hmm. So let's reflect. How do you want your biotic bioengineered future to feel? This is a deep question. Play with it. I bet you're not going to say the word corporate. I don't want it to feel corporate, but maybe you will. Nothing against that. Just curious. Who should be able to become a bioengineer? What would make the bioeconomy yours? We asked the question, what would make the bioeconomy American? Right? But what, let, let's flip it around, make it about you. Like, What would make a bioeconomy yours? What is your culture? Regarding all of this, like, what are you curious about? What are you nervous about? This bioculture conversation. If you could, how would you change the tools or practice of bioengineering to enable more of who or what you wish for regarding the questions just above? That's it. Be great.